Well, thank you, everybody. So we'll move on to the second session of today, which is the course of social justice in Ireland. And um, I'm very pleased to say that chairing the second session is Mick Clifford. Uh, Mick is an author, an investigative journalist, and a columnist with the Irish Examiner. He was named Journalist of the Year in the 2016 Journalism Award for his reporting on the Morris McCabe Gar the Whistleblower case. He is a regular presenter and contributor on current affairs programmes on Irish radio and television. Mick. Thanks very, thanks very much, John. And um, just want to say thanks to Tony Fahey for uh, inviting me to make a very small contribution to this because uh, just the opportunity to honour Sean we've known for so long and Bridget um, on an occasion like this I just it's a great honour just to be asked at all just very briefly in, in, in terms of my time working um, in the media I have to say the most uh, noticeable thing about Sean and Bridget and their work was the consistency that they were always there and I, I mean this in, in the most respectful way in a lot of ways like a shoe like, like a stone in the shoe of <laughs> both government and the power centres and, and the power of what they did and I think this was always very important because people can have trends and they can have rhetoric and what have you. The power in what they did was that all of what they presented was evidence-based and, and it was done in a way that could not be refuted and therefore it wouldn't go away and Michael Lee mentioned about things that ain't great here still. One can well imagine how much worse they would be without advocates of the calibre of the two people we're honouring here today. Now, our first paper in this session is going to be shared by uh, Dr. Catherine Kavna and uh, Dr. Michal Collins. And Catherine's going to start. Dr. Catherine Kavna is a lecturer in economics in University College Cork. Her research areas include compensation in the workplace, labour market policies, the skills and qualifications of workers, income distribution, and measures of progress. In her most recent research, she and Professor Charles M. A. Clark from St. John's University in New York have developed an index to measure the implementation of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. And any of you who are frequent attendees at uh, Social Justice Ireland's policy conference will be very familiar with attempts to um, follow the implementation of those goals. They've published many reports on performance of the EU 15 member states, including Ireland, in regard of the SDGs, a number of which have been published by Social Justice Ireland. Second half of this paper, Michal Collins. Michal is an economist and assistant professor of social policy at the School of Social Policy, Social Work and Social Justice in UCD. His research interests and publications are in the area of income distribution and poverty, taxation, fiscal welfare, pensions, economic evaluation and public policy. He was a member of Ireland's Commission on Taxation and the Irish Government's Advisory Group on Tax and Social Welfare. He served as the external member of the Irish Government's Interdepartmental Group examining the reform of Ireland's income tax and social insurance system. And I think Catherine is going to give the first half of this paper. Well, hello everybody, and I'm delighted to be here today to acknowledge Sean and Bridget's retirement and congratulate them on their significant achievements and contributions to policy debate over the last 50 years. I think it's very fair to say that you were both there for every single budget discussion and debate over the last 40 and 50 years, and you've provided so much important input into many, many policy issues, again, over that time frame. Um, I suppose if success is dependent on determination, then you both certainly showed us how it's done. So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, uh, income distribution, inequality and poverty. And we're going to take a look over the last 50 years to see what the data actually say. But first, I'm hoping that the technology that we have available to us today will be kind to us because my colleague Michal Collins is joining us all of the way from Auckland in New Zealand. Uh, it's the middle of the night over there, so I'm hoping he has plenty of coffee available and at hand to keep him awake for at least the next half an hour or so. So fingers crossed, Michal. Uh, 
So as I said, today we're going to take a brief look at some of the areas which have really been at the core of social justice as Ireland's work over the past 50 years, in particular income distribution, inequality and poverty. Now, of course, we all know that, and there's no doubt, that Ireland is a very different place today compared to the 1970s. Uh, a lot has changed, and we know that Ireland has now, according to The Economist at least, become one of the wealthiest and most you know, highly efficient economies in the global EU and OECD countries. However, we think that any, no assessment of an economy or any society can have any credibility unless it takes account of poverty and inequality. And indeed, I think it's worth mentioning that reducing poverty and inequality are central to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which we've mentioned earlier. And of course, we know that these two things, poverty and inequality, are inextricably linked. So I think it is timely and welcome to look back. Um, I suppose really what we'd like to see is what has changed and crucially what has not changed. And what role has policy played in those changes and what of policy going forward? So this is just a very brief outline of what we propose to talk about. So we'll move swiftly on and just to say that um, I suppose the key source of all our information really are some very important surveys, uh, the number one being the Household Budget Survey. Now the first national Household Budget Survey was undertaken by the CSO in 1973. So for the very first time this survey was able to provide insights into income and living standards although in truth this was really just a byproduct of the data. Previous surveys really only focused on urban areas. However, the 1973 data set for the first time allowed for the testing of income distribution and inequality using a much more up-to-date quantitative techniques of analysis. Now, data from the Household Budget Survey and their more recent counterparts has allowed us, therefore, to examine household consumption patterns, expenditure patterns, and income. It's also possible, of course, to assess the welfare of the population and its dis distribution, especially the, the prevalence of poverty. Now, when the surveys are actually carried out on a regular basis, they can be used to monitor the welfare of various population groups. So the data can obviously then very much inform policy making within the welfare and fiscal areas. And obviously there's a great deal of interest in the use of these surveys. They get a lot of attention when they are published, mainly to evaluate the results of government interventions, especially the effects of policy reduction measures. Now, I think it's fair to say that Ireland, as I said, is a vastly different country compared to the 1970s. And it is noteworthy also that the year uh, 1973 was the first year that we joined the EEC. So 2023 marks 50 years of EU membership for Ireland. Now, there are plenty of other writers and commentators who've analysed this transition in much more greater detail than we'll discuss here today. So we just want to mention a few very brief changes. So in terms of population, uh, not only has it grown over the years, the population, as we know, has become increasingly diverse. And these uh, demographic changes have a significant impact upon many spheres of life, including the workplace, including communities, towns and cities in our schools, and a lot of other kind of environments. Some examples are worth mentioning. Life expectancy in Ireland has grown significantly in the last 50 years from about 71 years of age to now over 81 years of age. GDP and GDP per capita have increased dramatically and we have seen several decades of income growth. Ireland is a more open economy. Trade, the composition of trade has changed and services are increasingly now a proportion of, a greater proportion of our output. We've also witnessed many significant changes 
to the composition, the size, and the structure of our labour market, including greater female participation and, of course, higher income earnings. Obviously, we have seen significant changes also in residential property prices over the past 50 years, and we all know that there are some lot more important consequences now for the housing market in the recent past. So I suppose really there have been some dramatic changes. However, despite significant income growth, we know that levels of income poverty and material deprivation have remained consistently high for certain groups, critically the less well off in our society. Now along the way, there have been some useful data collected and made available from many different sources. And this allows us to examine the themes we've just mentioned. And we draw on some of them here in our presentation today. So for example, I mentioned already the 1973 Household Budget Survey, which was really the start of some serious survey analysis. Subsequent surveys were undertaken by the CSO in 1980, 87, 94 to 95, 2000, 2001. Also in 1987, we had the survey of income distribution, poverty and usage by the ESRI for NESC. Uh, in the ESRI also uh, were responsible for the Living in Ireland survey from 1994 to 2001, so about eight waves of data there. And more recently, the survey of income and living conditions, uh, which is produced by the CSO, um, is conducted on a regular basis. So there's a lot, lot more information that's available, but I suppose a key challenge is knitting all of this different data together. And of course, this is very important because what we want is to make sure that we have consistent data with clear, good, correct results in order to inform policy making. So it's important that the, the analysis and the data is as rigorous as possible. As we can see, we have, are restricted in earlier years with some availability of data. And you know, some authors use different types of measures. So for example, there are different measures and approaches to the distribution of income. There are different approaches and definitions of what inequality is. So as I said, for consistency, we try to pull all of that together, drawing on some of the more recent writers. So again, um, I think we shall just see here some of these important studies and reports that we draw on here today. There's some very, very good work by Donald Murphy of the CSO to the CISI in 1974 and 1984. Following that, there were a lot of uh, CSO reports based on the household budget surveys. Um, Brian Nolan, from formerly the Central Bank and then the SRI, also produced a lot of work based on the Living in Ar uh, Ireland surveys. Um, following that, we have David Rothman and Mairead Reedy, who did some excellent work again on the 1987 report, uh, our data set for NESC. Tim Callan and his colleagues in the SRI again worked on the uh, Living in Ireland surveys. And more recently, a, a very, uh, I suppose, important initiative is the work that's being conducted by the ESRI, um, funded by the Community Foundation of Ireland on income and uh, poverty from 1987 onwards. And of course, this is supplemented, as I say, by the Silk reports, which have been ongoing since 2003. So the bottom line is here uh, today that we want to, uh, I suppose, get across the message that there is a lot more extensive data, a lot more reliable data available, uh, which allows researchers like myself and Michal to conduct a lot more analysis based on more, more stringent, I suppose, quantitative analysis and techniques. So our focus today, however, is going to be on disposable income, because really what we're interested in is the income that people have available from their earnings and welfare transfers less income tax. So it's really what do people have to spend? What do they have in their pockets? And that really is the focus of our, of, of our uh, talk today. Um, I'm now going to hand you over to Michal, and Michal is going to take you through some of the evidence, focusing really, I suppose, on the more recent data uh, to get you a, a sense of how we've progressed since the 1970s right up to today. Uh, okay, uh, thanks, uh, Catherine, and I hope uh, I can. Uh, the technology holds up for uh, hearing me as well. Uh, let me let me start by echoing what both uh, Catherine and Mick uh, said, and uh, I say I'm delighted to 
had the opportunity to contribute to today's event and uh, mark the uh, work of Bridget and Sean over the uh, so many years in uh, making very significant contribution uh, to public policy in Ireland and to uh, the issues that Catherine and I are focusing in on here. Uh, of those right down at the bottom of the income distribution, uh, really, and the level uh, and uh, welfare of uh, those uh, with the least resources uh, in our society. And that very much is the focus of where we're going to go uh, or continue to go uh, over the uh, rest of uh, the uh, presentation. Um, uh, as Catherine mentioned, yeah, Ireland's a very different place today than uh, if we go back to 1973 and that very first insight into um, uh, income uh, and uh, living standards as we begin to think about it today uh, in Ireland, or as we think about it today uh, in Ireland. Um, but uh, as Catherine mentioned, yeah, we're really thinking about, you know, the distribution of uh, the uh, resources. Uh, how are, uh, I suppose simply, is it fairer? Is it more unequal? Is it more uh, equal? How much has changed, if anything, at all over that period? And that's kind of generally where we want to go. Uh, uh, looking back uh, over that period uh, as well. Um, I, I'm going to kick that off by uh, looking at uh, households and their uh, income. Um, and that's where the, the very first uh, focus for uh, this kind of work looking at the distribution of income uh, in uh, Ireland uh, emerged. Um, uh, and it evolved over time from looking at households to looking at uh, individuals. And I'll, I'll reflect that uh, in just a second. But if we go right back to the uh, work of the 70s and into the 1980s, uh, the, the initial focus at least was uh, on uh, households. Um, and I'm going to focus in on uh, the, the share of the income pie that's gone to the top 20% and the bottom 20% uh, over that period. And you get kind of miserable tables like this, uh, if I can say it, uh, that, that uh, can uh, look at that um, reflecting the, the deciles of uh, the income distribution from the poorest 10% at the bottom to the top 10% at the top. And therefore, in a sense, the size of the slice of the income cake uh, that uh, flows uh, to uh, households uh, in that uh, distribution. Uh, and uh, we've just sort of put together across a few years or selected years across the 50 year period, uh, the uh, distribution uh, here, uh, which really draws on some of those reports that Catherine mentioned just uh, a few minutes ago. But I'm going to focus in uh, at the very bottom. So the share going to the bottom 20 percent and at the top, the share going to the uh, top uh, 20 percent. Um, but let me do it as a diagram, which is a bit more easy to, uh, I hope, uh, get your head around than a wall of uh, numbers and uh, a, a table of numbers uh, like that. Um, and uh, so this shows then that share going to the bottom and uh, top 20 percent uh, across the uh, 50 years. Um, and I suppose the kind of the, the issue, certainly when we look at households uh, to start with, is that there isn't a dramatically different change. Uh, to those shares. If you go back and look at what uh, the uh, Household Budget Survey 1973 found, and actually it took about a decade and a bit for that data to really come out and for us to begin to get our first understandings of it in the 80s through the work from Nesk and Rotman and Reedy um, in the late 80s and uh, onwards. Um, um, uh, they weren't alone, uh, but that's where it was all starting. Um, uh, but if you kind of look at the shares going to households, the, the uh, bottom 20% uh, of households has ended up getting about 5.5% of the income. That hasn't changed. It's bounced around a little bit uh, over the period. Um, and the top 20% bouncing around a bit too, but about 42% of uh, all of the income uh, that households receive going to uh, the uh, top 20% of the uh, population. So the, the story there is one, um, as maybe starting point, purely looking at households uh, of uh, lots of time passing, um, but not enormous changes in the proportion of disposable income going to the uh, top and uh, bottom 20%. Um, one of the challenges with looking at uh, data in that way, which is how much of the work uh, looking at income distribution in Ireland ran right up to the sort of 1990s, maybe uh, mid-1990s, uh, 
um, was uh, or is that uh, it's difficult to compare households sometimes because, of course, households can be different in terms of their size and composition. So there's a difference between a household with one person and a household with five people or whatever the case is, uh, those with children, those without children and so on. So uh, that leads to um, a sort of interest in trying to move away from households and to look at uh, individuals or to at least just that data. Uh, to look at uh, individual uh, incomes. And that is really how we tend to think about poverty and income distribution today. So we can kind of move it on to that. There's been an interesting debate on that when you go back through the uh, the literature on it. Um, the adjustment process is known as equivalization. So it's just trying an effect to determine the income per adult uh, in a, a household. Um, in a kind of an Irish sense, it really goes back actually to some of the work which I think might have been mentioned earlier uh, of uh, Seamus of Canada back uh, at the restart of the uh, the 1970s um, and uh, his sort of first insights, which I'll come back to, uh, into looking at poverty, um, uh, began to grapple with this issue which had emerged in the literature really over the uh, years prior to that and how much you make this adjustment for uh, household size and uh, composition. And therefore, actually uh, reflecting again a point that Catherine made earlier, the data that we end up having for this over time um, reflects the fact that different people answer that question in different ways. So Rotman and Reedy, uh, if for Nesk uh, in uh, 1988, and uh, Donald Murphy for the uh, CSO uh, in one of the Statistical Social Inquiry Society papers uh, in 84, um, use an adjustment or an equivalization process, really reflecting what had happened in the UK um, based on uh, rural, uh, the value of rural social welfare payments in the age of children. So they made an adjustment. Uh, and I've kind of bolted that on or put that next to uh, more recent work from the uh, ESRI um, and the Community Foundation of Ireland, who have used the, the OECD's modified equivalent scale for uh, looking uh, at data. Um, uh, I'll sort of say that to preface this graph, which uh, allows me to pull all that together. So again, I'm back to looking at the bottom 20% and I'm back to looking at the top 20% of individuals uh, this time uh, in Irish society over that period from 73 uh, up to uh, 2021. We don't have the 2022 uh, data uh, just yet. Um, and one, uh, and with the note that there's slightly different calculations associated with the 73 and uh, 80 uh, figures here. Um, but again, you uh, the picture there may be slightly different when we look for um, uh, uh, individuals, uh, a story over those 50 years of uh, there being a small increase in the share that's gone to the uh, bottom 20 percent. So you see that that blue line at the bottom sort of rising slowly uh, over time. Um, and a small decrease uh, to what share has gone to the, the top 20%. Uh, over time as well. Uh, a word of caution at the very end of uh, that graph too, there's a sort of interesting pandemic effect, uh, which I think we haven't really figured out as researchers yet, and we probably won't know enough about it until about four or five years time, um, um, when, when in a sense, much of the, the data work and analysis and maybe thinking on this has been done. But uh, the, the pandemic, the tail end, was a major piece of redistribution uh, in Irish and other societies uh, where the government stepped in um, where the incomes of those who were best off fell quite a bit, uh, the incomes of the, uh, others in the middle were uh, too, obviously did, and the government did big, big transfers uh, to uh, uh, the welfare system and variations of the welfare system to uh, support individuals. It had a very significant positive effect on inequality and poverty, uh, inequality in particular, which fell uh, over that period, and that's what you're seeing at the very tail of uh, that uh, graph uh, there. But the kind of general trend, small increase at the bottom, small uh, decrease uh, at the top. And there are other measures that kind of try, and that's just looking at the top and bottom 20%. There are other measures that try and capture everybody uh, together. So uh, there are uh, inequality measures that look at the inequality of income overall and the distribution. The kind of classic measure there is called the Gini coefficient, which goes from zero to 100. The higher the number, the greater the level of inequality. And we can calculate that then right the way back along and begin to see uh, if it's changed uh, over uh, time as well. Again, slightly different uh, calculation mechanisms uh, for um, some of the reports uh, looking at this. So 
uh, the recent ESRI reports that followed an OECD approach, and the CSO continued to publish the uh, national equivalent scale, which is sort of the formal uh, national benchmark uh, for uh, all of this. But anyway, if we do all of that and put it together, they don't really find particularly different uh, results. Uh, so the higher the number here, the higher the level of income inequality in Ireland. Well, the story for uh, income inequality over the period that we can calculate it for, uh, which is really from 87 onwards, um, is that inequality has fallen uh, over time. Um, not dramatically, not massively, but nonetheless, the, there's been a kind of a small but clear decrease in uh, income inequality over time. Ireland has become fairer in terms of its uh, income distribution over time. Again, a bit of a pandemic blip at the tail end, which we'll see, which sort of changes things uh, a little bit. But nonetheless, the trajectory uh, is uh, in uh, that direction. OK, so a 50 year view, as much as Catherine and I can kind of pull it together, uh, looking at uh, income in Ireland um, and income distribution in Ireland, uh, I suppose, in summary, a decrease, a small decrease in income inequality. Uh, and when we think about it for individuals, uh, a small growth in the share that's gone to the uh, bottom at uh, 20% uh, and a small drop uh, at the uh, top of some. Um, as Catherine mentioned, we wanted to talk about poverty as well, given that it's one of the areas uh, that are obviously very relevant to this um, and uh, one of the areas that's uh, been such a huge focus for the uh, work of Bridget and Sean uh, over uh, the uh, the many, many uh, decades uh, uh, as well. And I suppose, again, if we take the, the 50 year view, if you go back to the early 1970s and as this sort of uh, data began to uh, emerge. It, it sort of paralleled uh, an, an emerging or a re-emerging interest uh, in poverty in the early 1970s and some of those poverty conferences and so on that happened at that time, uh, I think may have got a, a mention earlier uh, as well. Um, uh, and those new surveys began to allow uh, new assessments of uh, poverty as well. And then there was kind of a lot of literature emerging and a lot of methodological debates as well around how you might do this and how you might look at it and how we might measure poverty and um, whether we should measure poverty uh, as a sort of a number or uh, which might be just a nominal amount of money linked to welfare payments or whether it should be a proportion of uh, income, so a relative or absolute measure. Uh, how uh, we should make those adjustments for household size and composition, um, and indeed whether we should measure poverty as it was initially measured as a percentage of, med of mean income, the uh, average income uh, versus uh, median, the middle income. And over time, it's shifted, uh, as you'll see, from mean uh, to uh, to median. Those kind of discussions were going on. Um, I, I, I clipped in here um, a table from um, uh, Callan et al.'s report on poverty, Income and Welfare in Ireland, published in 89. And I'm grateful, I must say, to somebody at NESC and the ESRI and other places who have scanned in these old reports uh, from way back. It's actually an idea for Social Justice Ireland to scan in all of those past reports so that they're up there online and available uh, to uh, everybody. Um, but anyway, that report is there. And there's kind of interesting table uh, from that, which I just wanted to show rather than talk true, uh, which kind of summarized uh, some of those uh, early explorations of uh, poverty in Ireland from Seamus O'Canada back uh, in uh, 72 uh, and, and onwards to some work. Uh, he came back at it again in 80. There was some work by uh, Roach um, in from the Statistics Department of Trinity College, which fed into uh, some of the work of the Commission of Social Welfare um, uh, as well. Edna Fitzgerald did some work using the uh, House of Budget Survey data in the early 80s uh, as well, and, and some of the other uh, reports that we've mentioned too as well. Various people sort of looking at uh, issues to do with uh, poverty and trying to grappling with those issues of what might we do, and given that we've got new information and data, how might we begin to get an answer uh, for uh, for this. I suppose all of that ultimately got to uh, a point where uh, we ended up with a national equivalent scale, in other words, sort of a, a way in which we now adjust for household size and composition. Uh, that eventually came out of work, that report uh, just mentioned from Cal et al. in uh, 1989, where they kind of explored a number of ways and actually ended up very similar to what Shims Canada had uh, done in his work back in 1971. Uh, there's almost no difference in terms of the um, uh, equivalent scale that was used uh, there and, and sort of variations of that uh, along the way uh, from Roach 
uh, as well. Um, uh, and we measured poverty and the poverty line as 50% of mean equivalized disposable income. So disposable income adjusted for uh, the size of composition of households to get that individual effect uh, up to the early 2000s. And from the early 2000s onwards, it adjusted to what we talk about today with a poverty line at 60% of the middle, the median uh, equivalized disposable income. So I'll pull the two of those uh, into some of the figures uh, I'll show you uh, in uh, just uh, a second. And they come from the, the different reports. Again, the Catherine mentioned earlier uh, that uh, looked uh, at this. And so before I show you that, I mean, I suppose to kind of summarize the story for poverty in Ireland, then over the period that we've been able to have estimates and measures uh, of it, I, I'd certainly read it as sort of a period where we've had waves of poverty um, uh, and that poverty over the, the last 50 years, um, at least when we think about it and measure it as a uh, in uh, income terms, which is far from a perfect measure, but but it's the way in which we at least uh, start off by looking at these things. And um, the proportion of people who we record as being uh, living below the poverty line in poverty um, or at risk of poverty, another phrase that's used, um, uh, has sat somewhere between 13 and 20 percent of the population. You, you'll see that the sort of downward trajectory over the 50 year period, but uh, there's waves. It goes up and down. And simply, I suppose, to summarize uh, that you, you tend to uh, we've tend to see have seen over that period poverty rise as the economy strengthens, uh, as employment grows, as, as wage growth happens, as income tax reductions feed through from uh, the exchequer, which has more resources uh, at those points uh, in time. Um, and generally, over that, those periods, welfare dependent households slip uh, behind those uh, which are reflected, as you'll see, those with the lowest uh, incomes. And then we end up with a period of uh, welfare catch up, uh, which tends to be driven by those who campaign for a welfare catch up. And you can, if I was in the room, I'd be pointing towards Bridget and Sean uh, at, uh, at this point as uh, you know, the people who very much led that across those waves uh, over uh, most of those uh, decades. Um, uh, and so, you know, welfare begins to catch up. I think, by the way, it also reflects the sort of social solidarity of uh, Irish society as well, where there's a kind of view that people shouldn't fall behind and that there is a uh, not just um, uh, a social and perhaps political reflected in that uh, willingness to uh, implement those uh, as well. And therefore, you know, there is an increase in transfers to people who are dependent on welfare. Poverty tends to fall back when that happens as well. And then, unfortunately, the cycle repeats again. And indeed, if you were to look at Ireland today, we're probably at the start of that cycle or we're well into the start of that cycle. Employment growth, wage growth, tax cuts, uh, welfare falling behind. And, uh, you know, you get the story that's happened on a number of occasions over the, uh, the last uh, 50 years. Therefore, the campaigning needs to go on. Otherwise, uh, uh, those people will uh, end up being uh, left behind. So to kind of summarize then what that tells us uh, over the, the period for uh, relative income poverty uh, in Ireland, so slightly different ways of measuring it from 73 into the early uh, 2000s, and then the, the kind of standard way we do it today uh, from uh, reflected uh, in the, uh, the green line. Um, we... Um, uh, so these are the rates, the proportion of the population uh, living below the poverty line. So you can kind of see that fall uh, over time, um, but not steadily. It goes up and down over the period for all sorts of different reasons. In a sense, we've got to have a much longer discussion of all. And many of you will have lived through all those different um, uh, eras as you go through those waves of uh, poverty uh, across the period. Again, a pandemic blip at the tail end, which brings it down to its lowest uh, level. Um, uh, but generally the trend of a decrease in poverty uh, over that period. Uh, and out of curiosity, if you were to do it for a headcount, in other words, the numbers of people in poverty, and of course the population has changed dramatically over the period. Uh, so poverty peaked at the very start of uh, this century, about 800,000 people, uh, and has declined over time. But of course, uh, in, not by huge numbers actually over time when you see it in that kind of graph, because given the uh, we've had significant growth uh, in the population uh, over time. We talk about six, about 670,000 people, if we're to take the most recent figure, live on an income uh, below the, the poverty line. Uh, and I thought talking uh, about that, there's a kind of merit in, in, in pointing towards uh, the importance of welfare supports for uh, 
uh, individuals who are in poverty or very near to poverty, which would be sort of the, the, the theme that uh, Catherine and I want to sort of round out this presentation uh, on as well. And that importance shouldn't really be uh, overlooked. Uh, the dominant source of income uh, for the bottom two deciles of the income distribution are welfare uh, transfers uh, from uh, the state. Uh, if you go and look at the CSO's figures, uh, the most recent figures from their silk surveys, uh, and you ask the question, well, how much of the disposable income um, that people receive comes from uh, uh, welfare transfers in various ways? Uh, the answer is it's seventy three percent of the income of the bottom twenty of the bottom ten percent. It's sixty seven percent of the income of the of the next decile up, and it's fifty three percent of the income of uh, the next decile up. Uh, from uh, that. So it's a big, big portion of the income of the, the those with the, the lowest incomes in uh, Irish society. Uh, and I turn that into a kind of a brief graph to uh, make that point. So how much of all of the income going to those who are in the bottom deciles of our society comes from welfare transfers? And therefore, in a sense, how important is welfare to the uh, income, well-being, standard of living, uh, of uh, individuals in those groups. And it's very pronounced, as you can see, right at the bottom of the income distribution. It breaks down into the various different payments which the, the CSO uh, break uh, out. Um, but if you look at the bottom 30%, the bottom three uh, deciles, uh, and the importance of uh, welfare uh, to, uh, to those groups. And I was thinking, kind of looking at this diagram, uh, that those are the people that Social Justice Ireland speak for and have spoken for for a very long time. And Bridget and Sean have spoken uh, to uh, and for, uh, uh, for a very long time. It's their income and it's the uh, protection of their income or the increase in their income or ensuring that those groups don't fall behind. And of course, those groups are um, uh, if they are so dependent, therefore, on the on uh, welfare receipts uh, that um, decisions in public policy terms around welfare are really crucial uh, to the well-being of a very large proportion of the population, uh, which is uh, reflected in that graph there. Um, uh, and welfare is very effective uh, in, in um, reducing poverty over time as well. Without, well. without the welfare transfers, you get the black line. With welfare transfers, you get the green line. So redistribution, true welfare, uh, reduces the proportion of individuals uh, who will be uh, in poverty. Uh, this kind of diagram is very kind of conceptual more than anything else, because we have a welfare system. It works, but it shows uh, how important uh, it, it is. Um, I think the one thing I'd say looking at that over the period is the job of the welfare system has increased uh, over time. So there's more transferring to be done to begin to bring levels of poverty down to the the, the stable, if not falling, rates that we've seen uh, over time. Uh, um, uh, and to bring us towards the, the, the end then, um, uh, we thought we'd finish by making a brief comment on poverty today. Um, and to look at those who are living just around the poverty line uh, in uh, Ireland uh, today. And Mick said it uh, earlier uh, that what Social Justice Ireland uh, and what Sean and Bridget have tended to do uh, over time uh, is to do something what tends, which has tended to be very awkward for those who aren't necessarily in favour of their views or aligning with their views, which is to point to the evidence and to base things on the basis of evidence. So this is kind of pointing towards the, the current evidence and we can think about, well, who are uh, those in an, living in and around the, the poverty line uh, today? Lots of other studies looking at who's in poverty, social justice, and do great work uh, in that uh, area uh, as well. Um, but we thought it would be interesting to, uh, to look at those around the poverty line. Uh, out of interest for the 660,000 people living in poverty in Ireland, the poverty line for a single adult is three, just over 300 euro. Uh, so below that, somebody is deemed at risk of poverty, above it, they're uh, out of poverty. Uh, but it's it's kind of interesting to think that there's an awful lot of people very near that threshold. Um, uh, there's an awful lot of people just on the edge of having escaped poverty above the poverty line or just below the poverty line who are in poverty, but very near uh, to uh, getting out. And therefore, small changes uh, to uh, uh, income levels, uh, in a sense, holding everything as constant, uh, could lift uh, out or shift people into poverty in quite a dramatic way. And it's kind of worth looking at that because it makes uh, a point, I hope, briefly on the sort of precarity of uh, our poverty figures and how close people are to being in or being uh, out uh, of poverty. 
Uh, so let me kind of explain it uh, briefly with uh, a diagram um, uh, which sort of pulls that information together. So this is a count of the number of individuals uh, around the poverty line. So if you if you look at the first green, um, so well, the the um, uh, the green column associated with uh, 109,000 people. Uh, so that's uh, a column. Can I point to that on the screen? It's there. Um, uh, that's a column which sort of says, well, if the poverty line was 10 euro lower than what it currently is, who would leave poverty? So by uh, the poverty line falling, who would drop out of poverty? Or to put it another way, who, uh, how many people are within 10 euro of the poverty line? They are um, below the poverty line, but only just below the poverty line. There's about 100,000, 110,000 as such people. There's 200,000 if you go 20 euro below the poverty line. There's 250,000 if you go 30 euro below uh, the poverty line. So there's a lot of people very near on a weekly basis uh, to uh, having an income uh, that is outside of poverty, but uh, they are uh, uh, currently uh, in poverty. And I put it as green because they would leave poverty if the line were to... Uh, fall. And at the other side, were the poverty line to rise, why might that happen? Well, because the income of everybody else in society grew faster than uh, the um, uh, the income of those of the least in society, and therefore more people would end up falling below uh, the relative poverty line. Well, if the relative poverty line increased by 10 euro uh, a week, there'd be an extra 100,000 people in poverty. By 20 euro a week, there'd be an extra 200,000 people in poverty. And by 30 euro a week, there'd be an extra three. Uh, 100,000 uh, people uh, in poverty. We don't need to get into the figures uh, a whole lot other than to say, I suppose, uh, very small changes in the value of the poverty line would dramatically alter the uh, number of people uh, uh, in poverty. And so when we look at these poverty uh, statistics and the current figure for poverty is that blue bar here, 13 percent of the population live on an income below the poverty line. But if the poverty line changed by a very small amount, um, uh, it's the case that we could have a lower level, 11% or 9%, or a higher level, 15%, 17% of the population uh, in poverty. So there's a real kind of precarity uh, to those uh, poverty figures uh, that we hear about from time to time, and indeed that dominate a lot of uh, the very good work that organisations like Social Justice Ireland uh, and others do. And so sometimes poverty does jump up. Because frankly, we we uh, don't protect the income of those of the uh, the least, and therefore they fall behind, and those poverty lines uh, begin to uh, increase. And similarly, if we do assist them, it's possible uh, more than others in society. It's possible for poverty uh, to uh, fall. Um, and uh, just to briefly uh, round that out by saying, well, if we just purely focus on those either side of the poverty line of ten euro a week or less than ten euro a week. Uh, either side of the uh, poverty line. Uh, who are they? Um, well, uh, those who are very near to falling into poverty, if the poverty line were to uh, change by, uh, uh, increase by 10 euro a week, uh, or uh, would, who would fall into poverty and who are they? Uh, well, they tend to be retired people and they tend to be children. That's the, the simple, simple answer uh, to that. And if poverty were the poverty rate were to fall, and so a whole lot of people left poverty, uh, who would those hundred thousand people be? Well, they're principally retired people, and they're principally uh, children as well. So they're welfare dependent individuals who are very near to the poverty line, and therefore small changes in their income uh, can have very dramatic effects on at least our measures of poverty. Uh, uh, whatever about uh, you know, dramatic changes in the, the living standards of uh, those uh, individuals. So Mick, uh, just to, to kind of pull it all together and uh, uh, finish uh, as well, um, uh, Catherine and I have worked on this uh, uh, before and been nudged by uh, Bridget and Sean back along to do some work on income distribution and poverty. So it's a pleasure to uh, come back to this and uh, look at this uh, issue to cast it uh, over that 50-year uh, a period which fits so well for the work of Bridget and Sean and for the uh, data for uh, Ireland uh, as well. When we think about it, income distribution hasn't changed a whole lot. Inequality has certainly fallen over time, slowly and small uh, has been the sort of downward trajectory in uh, inequality uh, over time, reflecting things like some moves at least to address the inequity in market earnings in particular uh, in society. 
Poverty certainly has had a downward trend over that period, but ways have changed reflecting that, and that key role of welfare payments shouldn't ever be overlooked for those uh, at the bottom of the uh, income distribution. And those around the poverty line, well, there's still a precarity uh, to uh, those numbers as well, and we shouldn't forget how many people are so near to either leaving or falling into uh, poverty. Uh, when we begin to uh, have discussions uh, on that. I know that's a point that Bridget and Sean will have had in their head in various ways uh, for uh, a very long time too. And I'll finish with one uh, point, which is it kind of strikes us uh, looking at this, that the one thing that's missing here uh, is wealth. And uh, we uh, don't uh, have we haven't sort of really mentioned wealth at all, but actually over the last uh, decade, we've um, really got the first set of robust information on uh, the wealth of individuals and households in Ireland. Um, and uh, uh, there is potential for better, much more integrated insights into living standards if we were to push ourselves uh, on for uh, 20 years time. And we look at another Social Justice Ireland uh, conference looking back over time in the decades uh, to come. I'm sure we'll be talking a lot more about wealth into the future as well, or at least understanding people whose income arises in the context of either no wealth, very little wealth or lots of wealth. Uh, and that's a slightly different perspective that we'll um, that, uh, need to, to bring to that. Uh, mapping it into what we've talked about, I suppose with wealth data, we are very similar to where we were with income data back in the 1990s. So the, the data is becoming available and it will move on to uh, inform uh, the uh, process uh, over time. Uh, so a fascinating period uh, to look at Ireland and uh, uh, a really important role uh, that uh, Bridget and Sean have played uh, over that period uh, in uh, focusing on those right down at the bottom, that bottom 30%, uh, the income of those groups and um, uh, in a sense, either protecting or enhancing uh, their income and the importance that reflected in the inequality figures and in the uh, poverty figures as well. And I'll stop uh, there. Thank you.